So hi, everybody. My name is Bethany Groff Durow, and I am thrilled to welcome you to the Newburyport Literary Festival. This is the 16th year of the Literary Festival. It is our second year. Oh, my official timepiece is going to tell us that we're ready to rumble. There's, uh, there's something in each room in my house, so I picked the clock as the least annoying. At least that keeps me on, tar on target for time. Um, so again, 16th year of the Literary Festival, second year as a virtual festival. It's our biggest one ever. We've had over 100 authors uh, over the course of our weekend, and I am just thrilled to be part of it. I am a writer and historian, uh, but for today's uh, purposes, I am representing the Literary Festival as a member of the steering committee. So it's a volunteer run organization, and we are so happy to have your support. So a few quick housekeeping items. One is that uh, we are using the Zoom webinar uh, system, which means you can see us, but we cannot see you. If you'd like to talk to each other, uh, please feel free to do so in the chat feature. Uh, there is another feature called the Q&A. And if you have a question for any of our presenters, please put it in the Q&A format rather than the chat. It's an easier way for us to monitor uh, direct questions. Uh, but feel free to discuss with your fellow attendees in the chat. So uh, with no further ado, oh, last thing, uh, obviously our local bookshops need your support more now more than ever. So if you have a chance uh, and you'd like to purchase any books from this festival, please visit our, two of our partner bookshops, which are um, Jabberwocky Bookshop in Newburyport and the Bookshop of Beverly Farms, obviously in Beverly Farms, or if you live somewhere far away, someone's saying hi from California right now, please uh, patronize and support your local bookshop. So without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce our panelists today. So we are going to start with um, Bert. Bert Snow is an artist and designer and for the last 21 years has been the coordinator of the annual outdoor sculpture at Maudsley Show. In his artwork, Bert aims to leave room for viewers to engage with sculptures, which often involves physically setting things in motion. Bert also works as a game designer focused on games that are used in learning. Welcome, Bert. Nancy, Nancy Sander is a long-term member of the Outdoor Sculpture at Maudsley Organizing Committee and has submitted work in 19 of the 21 exhibits. She's a mixed media sculptor who formerly ran a puppetry business called Roaring Duck Puppets. Uh, and Joyce, Joyce Audie Zarens. Did I say that right, Joyce? Yes, very oh, good. Ten for points for you. Thank you. <laughs> has written fiction and nonfiction books for children, articles <laughs> for periodicals and blogs, and is a widely exhibited sculptor with a degree from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. She has participated in 16 of the Maudsley Sculpture exhibits, and I am thrilled to welcome all of you here today. Thanks, Bethany, and also to all the other organizers of the Literary Festival, because it's really a wonderful thing that you've done for the community. So um, we're talking about the book today, and one of the inherent aspects of the outdoor sculpture exhibit at Maudsley is that the exhibits themselves are ephemeral. They only last for three weeks, and then they're gone. So one of the real benefits of having a book is that this 184 pages um, of the book changes that by freezing the, the uh, elements of the show in time. So, um, so for 20 years, local artists, myself and Nancy and Bert included, uh, have run a popular three week outdoor sculpture exhibit that's unlike any other, at least that's what we think. Um, and that is the reason for the celebratory book. Uh, it's, the show is egalitarian. It's open to any art, anyone who wants to put a piece in. The pieces are site specific, which kind of distinguishes them from museums and galleries. And um, they relate to the, very closely to the landscape. How it came about that we decided to do this book is that in 2018, Bert was asking what are we going to do that's special for the 20th anniversary, which would be 2019? So someone suggested, um, David Davies suggested a retrospective, which should still happen. It's been delayed by COVID and I suggested this book. So it took about a year or so to write the text. Um, I also had to hunt down the photographs, which was fun. 
Um, the earliest of which of the photographs over 20 years, the earliest ones are not digital. So that means some of them are still in somebody's dusty shoebox under a bed somewhere, I don't know. But we did find enough for the book. Uh, the book covers how the show is organized, funded, and contains anecdotes about the artist and the art. So once the text was written, the next step was to choose a book designer. We were so fortunate that Lynn and Jane Havighurst of Artfluence um, in Essex, Mass, agreed to design the book. Their work um, reinforces the visual connections and supports the text. Like you notice that the angles between David Davies' sculpture on the left and, and the photograph on the bottom kind of echo. You know, they, they were really good at laying out the double page spread so that they showed the work to best advantage. Lynn and Jay are um, Maudsley artists themselves. So they have um, participated in the shows for a number of years and also they designed the posters in recent years. They've designed the posters and catalog covers. So they've already, they had already established an aesthetic for the book, I mean, for the show. So that's why one of the reasons we chose them. So their clear layouts and attention to detail really enhance the photographs. Obviously, the photographs themselves of the artwork um, have a lot of visual value, but having them shown to the best uh, ability was um, the best advantage is, is the best. So working with, um, with the two of them, both of them worked on the book, but my contact was mostly Lynn. So she and I would change, exchange emails back and forth. And Lynn is very detailed oriented. And we had a lot of fun because in addition to the regular hours of work, we were exchanging emails in the wee hours of the night <laughs> and just being silly and stuff sometimes. Um, so their creativity shows uh, in, this, in this spread, you can see on the left, there's a graph there. You know, some of the information that's in the book is text, some is pictures, but then we also had some other sort of non-fiction-y things to uh, include like one important aspect of the show is how it's funded. And the cultural councils in our area for years, ever since the beginning of the show, have contributed some of the money that runs the show. We have expenses like the, the free catalogs that we give every, all the, anyone who visits the show and insurance for the, um, to cover the show and the fees the park charges. So um, how do you convey that though? You know, which years, which towns have contributed? And so I gave her a little pencil sketch of, you know, a layout with the years and, and whatnot marked on it. And then she, they came up with this wonderful chart with the trees in the background and everything. Another example is at the end of the book, instead of a traditional index, um, I gave her my spreadsheet of all the years and all of the artists, you know, three, over 300 artists, 700 sculptures, and she converted it to a, this really nifty looking uh, index. So they're very creative. Of course, the book is really about the artwork shown in over 400 photographs, but there are also many stories in, um, within. Oops, excuse me. There were 305 artists of, in the first 20 years. We've had one more year of shows, so I have, we've got now 350 artists almost. Almost half of those have art degrees or are professional artists, and there were over 700 sculptures. So obviously the book is only a slender sampling of what was available. Um, so the genesis of the Maudsley, uh, outdoor sculpture at Maudsley actually happened a couple of years before, during the Parker River Festival in 1996, where there were four artists. Caroline Bagano, um, somebody suggested that an outdoor sculpture show might be a good part of the festival. And Caroline Bagano had experience with outdoor sculpture and inspired 
Nina Tannis, Vivian Metcalf, and Tim Puritan to create a spontaneous exhibit of four artists. This is Vivian's piece, um, Current Flags, which kind of really shows the tidal movement of the water. This is a salt marsh, so the water level rises and lowers and the flags kind of enhance that. By 1997, there were 17 artists, um, a catalog, and many other aspects that we still use um, today. Caroline and Nina organized this show mainly by word of mouth. Um, there was a printed grant funded catalog with the map um, that shows where each of the pieces is, a brief artist statements and bios, a walkthrough to choose the sites and tour with the artists during the reception. Unfortunately, the um, Parker River Festival was disbanded. So then there's the what happens now moment. And Nina decided, you know, we can't let this thing die because it was popular already. And so um, she approached the staff at Maudley State Park. In 1998, they agreed. And in 1998, the show moved to Maudsley and has been there ever since. And that has been a wonderful thing. So the staff at the Maudsley Park, um, Rob Kovacs is the director and his other staff, over the years have tolerated some rather edgy art. In this example, um, Eric Legacy had a car that he couldn't sell. And so he drove it to the park, drained all the fluids out and cut it in half. <laughs> and uh, the park was pretty cool with it, actually. Another example is uh, Gordon and Damon's spider spider's nest of ladders, which even the artists in the organizing committee were like looking at it like, mm, this looks like a little tricky. Is it going to be stable and whatnot? But uh, Gordon and Damon did a great job of fastening, fastening everything together in a really sturdy way. It, and I think it might be possible that the reason nobody climbed on it is because it looks sort of sketchy, but it was quite stable and was not a problem. Um, this exhibit has also always been an incubator of creativity. You do things that you probably would not have tried otherwise. And like artists everywhere, <laughs> yeah, we laugh because we all have done that, haven't we? Um, so uh, artists always push the boundaries of what is possible. And here, um, this photograph is kind of like that iconic raising the flag at Iwo Jima image where it shows that we do aspire to do great things. Unfortunately, the long wooden legs were so slender and the wind was rather strong. So Egil Zarens, who's my husband and has taken a lot of the Maudsley photographs, took this photo, the only evidence of the entire sculpture, just as the legs started to crack. Eric had to shorten them for the exhibit. So at least we have a photograph. <laughs> um, and we also explore beauty. Um, unfortunately, weather is always present and it is rough on outdoor art. So um, this piece can't be shown elsewhere because it, it's you know, been impacted by the weather, but it was wonderful in terms of the color with the light coming through it, but also um, the two artists had included a lot of small images and little drawings and all kinds of things to look at in, in the layers of the fabric. It was really lovely. And also explore light, space, and form. We experiment freely with new materials also. Um, at the park, at Mosley State Park, there is a wide array of inspiring settings. Um, part of the application process when an artist decides to submit something is that you have to state your choice of what site you would like, which um, those sites are eventually numbered and shown on the map in the catalog. The application also requires a drawing of the proposed artwork. Some of the drawings are pretty loose and open and sometimes they actually resemble the finished artwork, but <laughs> you're supposed to submit a plan, how it is to be anchored or supported 
and what media are to be used. Artists have used steel, Tyvek, farmer's row cover, stone, recyclables, PVC, and cast off furniture. There's no limit to what artists can envision using. Um, in this case, Chuck Mead has um, been using organic gourds and grows himself, and he has declared himself a gourd engineer. Uh, this piece kind of seems to ask the question, can art make him more intelligent? I don't know. <laughs> um, some works refer to meditative subjects or current events. Uh, you can see Soul Boat for Betty Friedman, the year that she died by Cameron Sesto and Rose's uh, lovely meditation. Others rely on features of the park. The park, um, is used to be an estate and there are some relics of the, um, the buildings in footprints of the buildings and Bettina's um, sound shrine is in the entryway of a very large root cellar that's on the property. It, that entryway, I don't know how tall it is, maybe 15 feet or something. The inside of it is 60 feet high. So uh, and Nancy's is taking advantage of the, the lawn, <laughs> using, the, using the grass wisely. Um, and respect for the park's beauty is paramount to, uh, in everybody's mind. This tree that Push Pull is draped around is one of, the, one of two Meta Sequoia or Dawn Redwoods that are very unusual trees that are um, in the park and have inspired many artists. So anyone can apply, um, anyone of any age too. When Sarah was 12, she did an artwork with Cameron Sesto, who was her teacher, her art teacher. The next year she did one with her dad, Joe Fix. Then she did her own and um, so there are no restrictions on who can submit art as long as they follow application and installation protocols. There is no juror. The park approves all applications though, just to make sure that everything is uh, safe and appropriate for public viewing. This, this freedom encourages experimentation and responsibility. So Sarah does her own and now Joe also does his own too. And he started, a, he is a structural engineer and did not start out as an artist, but he now exhibits his sculpture in other sh out, outdoor shows. And Sarah has gone on to earn an art degree. Sometimes father and daughter work together. Many of Joe's works involve illusion while Sarah's are eclectic. They fabricated this piece around an existing leaning tree. So this is a, kind of the ultimate kind of site-specific art where it's actually wrapped around the existing uh, landscape. Some installations are meant to be interactive as my daughter Melody dis discovered. Um, the picture of this piece that's in the book is the one on the left. Uh, David likes this image because the worn path coming through the middle kind of shows that so many people came through because it was, the path wasn't there when he installed the piece. That's, from, that's evidence of many feet. Here, viewers could try being inside a different color of skin. Some works are not only enticing, but also invite viewers to think about the world in different ways. After the exhibit ended, these enclosures had new life in people's yards, extending the idea of the concept of the, of the piece. Some sculptures are kinetic, musical, or otherwise interactive. The shows last fall and this September could not include interactive art due to the pandemic safety protocols, but usually they do. Some artists explore one idea in many ways. Most of Jay's, this is Jay Havighurst of um, one of the designers of the book. Most of Jay's artwork is sound related. Other artists expand their visual vocabulary every year with doing different things. 
Some artworks include statements about society as when post-consumer products are used. Since there's no funding for the artists, many use free or low cost materials. Some are man-made and some natural. These two artists savored people's curiosity. The use of peepholes into an enclosed structure which leads people to search for what may, may be seen inside plays on human nature, also a sense of humor. The Kirby kids are three young artists who have participated in four shows so far. <clears throat> Using a triangular frame and small Q&A doors, the piece on the left is an interactive piece focused on our perceptions of race and otherness using figures like Mae Jameson, the first black female astronaut in space and Caitlyn Jenner. And Bonnie, Bonnie Jean Malcolm received her art degree before most of us were born. She too is a regular. She constructed this monolith of roadside flattened uh, cans. Some installations are delicate or ephemeral Flurry is made from discarded Tyvek house wrap, wire, and paint. It is durable, while some artworks are not. The duration of the exhibit is partly determined by the lifespan of artworks. They must survive nor'easters and other weather events, as well as effects of many viewer interactions. While other works are massive, many artists reuse found objects. Even the tallest art looks smaller when sighted amid the expanse of landscape, but this artist is not afraid of scale. His 2019 sculpture was 30 feet tall. He sometimes has helpers. Transportation and assembly are significant aspects of site-specific sculpture, and everything for a show must be anchored and installed on one specific day, then removed completely on the last day of the exhibit, leaving no trace. <clears throat> COVID-19 has postponed our 20th year retrospective uh, planned for the Firehouse Center for the Art, Arts and the Brewery, but that will eventually happen, so please do come. My Alfresco Museum included a photo retrospective of my Maudsley installations, which is why I included this slide. Um, David Davies, Rose Rizzo, and others have already put considerable effort into what will be the uh, outdoor sculpture at Maudsley Retrospective. While the pandemic called a halt to that effort, we were successful in having our exhibit number 21 last fall with modifications for safety as we will do in September. And so this <clears throat> artist organized community supported all volunteer outdoor sculpture at Maudsley continues. The theme for the fall 2021 exhibit is reach our ladder thingies and other art dance on. Our book, Site Specific 20 Years of Outdoor Sculpture at Maudsley is a fundraiser intended to augment the tight budget of this exhibit. Hundreds of artists have volunteered their work. We think, the worth, we think it's worth the effort. So now it's time to hear from Bert and Nancy. For starters, Bert, how, do, how does it feel to have coordinated this creative incubator for so long? So, hold on, am I, oh good, I'm off mute. Um, thanks, Joyce, that was wonderful. You know, I think I almost would vote for more pictures and less talking. It's so great to just see the sculptures, especially you know, for, for those of us who have been involved for so many years. And um, I'm not dodging your question, but I am going to throw in the story before I answer it, which is, uh, Joyce mentioned Northeasters. And there was one year fairly early on where both Joyce and Nancy had made really marvelous pieces that were that were large scale and used um, fabric in different ways. And uh, both of those pieces were pretty much completely destroyed. Um, it was it was one of the worst North Northeasters we've had, but, um, <laughs> but we've had some bad ones. And well, can I interject there, though? They were almost completely destroyed for one day. And then they were resurrected magically, right? Because that's part of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I feel like over 20 years, you know, it, part of it is, is, is um, <clears throat> seeing, you know, kind of going into it every year and thinking, 
wow, you know, are we going to pull this off again? Because we really, it, it is an all volunteer effort. And we run on a, on a very much of a shoestring budget, um, you know, from, from grants and from, uh, from catalog ad sales or what are now sort of ads on our signboards, but um, we pull it off and, and I now just have a sense of faith because for so many years, you don't know which artist is going to come up with, which artists are going to come up with the things that completely amaze you that year. Um, but it happens, you know, and this last year with everything that was going on was a really, was a really strong show. I mean, they're just, there were lots of great work that, that got done. So I, I feel kind of honored, um, you know, the, when, after the first year we did the show at Monsley, uh, Nina Tannis, who had made that happen, moved to Ireland. And she just, you know, said to me, Bert, you'd be good at organizing this. Why, could you take it over? <laughs> so I did. And, uh, you know, not sort of thinking, and I will be doing this for a long time. Um, but it's really, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. So having, having had a chance to answer that question, I'm going to, I'm going to ask, um, Joyce, you a question back, um, as the author of, of, um, of the book, which I highly recommend, you know, it, it's, you know, writing a book about, so Joyce, writing a, a book about the story of a, of a show, you know, of the show itself of a community and, um, kind of telling the stories of, you know, many hundreds of artworks it was a big challenge. And I remember when you, when you took this on thinking, wow, I'm not, you know, this is not going to be easy. So could you talk a little bit of just about how you, how you chose to approach that? Well, you're right that there is, was a lot involved. And the first one of the first choices you have to make is how you're going to organize the different aspects that you want to cover. Like we have the factual stuff, like how is the show organized and run and how is it funded and all that. You have the artists and their artwork. And then you have this urge to talk more about the meaning of the works and how they connect with one another. So I could have done it, um, do one chapter on one subject, another chapter on another, but I decided to organize it according to the years and kind of use the braiding sweetgrass method. If you braid those three uh, elements together in each chapter, uh, and that's what I attempted to do so that every chapter has some things about the organizational stuff or whatever the other factual stuff, some of the anecdotes about what happened with the artist or something about you know, the piece. And at the same time, kind of interject some things about what the artwork, how the artwork connects from one to another and all those sorts of things. So that was the approach that I followed. So I hope that it's coherent enough as people read it, but that was my attempt, you know? Yeah, I think it really works wonderfully. And, and for me, I felt like you also kind of captured you know, the, the colorful stories that um, you know, different years, there were different challenges and, um, you know, and sort of related those challenges to the themes. And, um, and so it ends up being an interesting story about, you know, both about the progress of the show while connecting that to the artworks. Thank you. So can I um, address something to Nancy? You know, first I wanted to thank her for um, for beta reading the manuscript. You know, when you when you start a book, you get the whole thing together. You have your own opinion about it, but you'd like to have some feedback from someone else. And Nancy knows the show, so she, my sister, read it, and and Nancy read it, and a couple of other people. But I really appreciate the time you took to give me your thoughts and all of that sort of thing. 
So um, I, I just wanted you to know that I appreciate your input. Well, yeah. Oh, well, I, I'm just amazed at, at what you've accomplished. I mean, um, I don't know how I would have approached it, but you just, you pretty much encapsulated all the different aspects of the show and different, all the different varied types that have been uh, entered into the show. Gosh, thanks. I have a question for you though. Do you enjoy, uh, I know you write children's books and fiction mm -hmm. and this is nonfiction. So what do you enjoy writing more, fiction or nonfiction? How? how? I, I don't have a preference actually. I know some people, you know, some people have a preference and I don't really. I, of the published children's books that I have done, um, five of them I wrote, the other 15, I just did the, in the uh, artwork, but of those, one was nonfiction and the rest were fiction. And so this is a huge uh, difference for you. Well, it is somewhat different. I've written other things that were nonfiction. In some ways, nonfiction is easier because it's a matter of organizing what's already there rather than inventing something hmm. from scratch, you know? So uh, in the case of site-specific, like normally when you're writing a nonfiction, you have to find primary sources. Well, who are the primary sources? We are. In addition to our own what we know, how do you, how do I um, include commentary from people? Well, I did email people and, and ask questions and get input for, about various things, but what about the early days of the show? We don't even know where some of those artists are. So what I did was I relied on the catalogs. You know, in the catalogs, there's a statement from every artist. So there are things in here, like here's, Caroline's um, little poem that she used when she did this particular piece. So I could use a piece of that in the book. So what I'm driving at is the material is there. It's a matter of finding it and organizing it. Whereas with fiction, you have to develop the material entirely yourself. So they both, it's like doing artwork. Which is, do you, which do you prefer? Do you prefer painting or sculpture, Nancy? <laughs> you do both, right? Yeah, I don't know. I, I like making things I like out of exactly. materials. I like the challenge see and writing is just like that except that the medium you're using is words it's, it's the same thing it's creating something right yeah what if the same thing <laughs> yeah so Nancy here's a question for you so you know as as Joyce told us earlier you you know, have done a lot of work as a as a as a puppet maker, mm -hmm. and um, you know I don't know if in advance of this show you would have said I'm a sculptor, but you very much are. I'd be just interested in how you sort of thought about that transition when you started making artwork and for the show, and and how you think about it now, and has that changed? Well. I think the biggest advantage was, um, I mean, I, I, I did make sculpture, uh, but in working with puppets, they were hand puppets, they were small. And what Maudsley has offered to people is this huge space, which is yeah. unusual. Most artists, you know, don't get that opportunity to put something in the out of doors. And, uh, I think if I hadn't been involved in Maudsley, I wouldn't have become involved in making really big puppets later on for a course because, um, and I think it's better than doing crossword puzzles to keep your mind sharp, really. <laughs> because you have to figure out all these different, you have to consider the weather and you have to consider uh, measurements and math and and uh, physics and it and and then you can you know history and all of that and then you think of nature and where you want to put this piece you 
that's what I love about Mozzie. It's the site specific name of the book is that there is some place in the park that you just envision something. My problem is that over the years, I'm having a harder time choosing three spots where I'd want to put something. I want it all in that spot, period. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you're such so a you have to be flexible. I mean, Bert, have you ever had issues with uh, flexibility of placement of things? Well, you know, artists are all, you know, logical, reasonable people. So uh, <laughs> never. But um, well, so just, just a word on that. So what we do is we ask um, artists who want to apply to the show to come up with an idea for what you want to do and describe it and ideally give us a sketch, although the definition of sketch is sketchy. And uh, we have an unofficial, uh, never actually awarded internal award for, the, for the, the worst possible sketch that we get each year, which, which as these things go, has, has no bearing on, on the sculpture that shows up, right? Because, but anyway, then we say, pick three spots in the park that would work as sites. And when everything comes in, we, we tour around and, you know, inevitably there's, there's some things that, you know, two artists that might envision something in the same site or that are close to each other. But it always works out because, you know, as artists are out there on the site, they, you know, they, they see where, all right, well, they're number two site might work just as well and hey you know now that i'm here i actually see this other spot over here that i hadn't noticed before and could i change to that site you know so it has it it always works out and yeah anyway so so joyce how about a question a question for you so Well, I guess, you know, you talked about, about working with the designer. So I'm, instead of asking this question, I'm just going to say something about the, the, one more thing about Lynn and Jay Havakurst. So they are both sculptors in the show, which is wonderful. Um, they are accomplished graphic designers. Um, and so, you know, they just have th that set of double qualifications. Um, I actually, hired Lynn Havakhurst for her first job as a graphic designer in Cambridge, where I was working as an art director back then. And she, I know, uh, spent a number of years designing art books uh, for a, it, was it Rockport Publishers, I think, that, uh, that the maker of art books. And then, you know, in, our, in Joyce, choosing to write the book, the author of the book is, you know, a writer, an experienced writer, an illustrator, a, a sculptor who, unlike most of us, actually is capable of working in steel. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and so we just, you know, these kinds of, of um, I guess this is a long way of saying we, what, one of the things that's come from the show is a very strong community yes. that, has, that has, you know, built up over the years that it just gives us, you know, strengths to draw on um, that are that are really shown in the book. I would agree with that. The, the, by being involved in Maudsley, um, I've gotten to know some just wonderful people. And it's. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to be subtle, but I didn't mean to cut you off in mid-thought. We didn't have a lot of we have a lot of questions coming in, so I wanted to um, give you the opportunity to answer some questions, if that's okay. Do you have any other questions? That'd be great. Okay, wonderful. Well, first, I'm going to give you a big compliment from one of our readers here. Um, it was from Priscilla, who says, "I I came to this session as a fan of the show, but an even bigger fan of the book site specific." It's a marvelous accomplishment in design and text as a history, a celebration, a good story, and a reference work. It should be a leading contender for some national award as an art book. Have you found anywhere to submit it for greater notice? I'm not gonna say that this is probably one of your friends, but this may be one of your friends. 
No, I, one thing we should make clear is that um, because of the nature of the book being um, about the anniversary and the time frame considered, we did not go submit it to regular publishers. We, we um, went to Amazon, the dreaded evil Amazon. <laughs> so the reason it's at Jabberwocky is that it's on consignment there. I bring them books and they, they sell them there. They're not, um, it's not available through regular bookstores. Uh, and that's probably because right, Bert mentioned, what should we do for the, the uh, anniversary in 2018? The, the anniversary is 2019 and the book came out July of 2019. You know, it's a time, the reason that it's a self-published thing is that it's time specific. So well, maybe eventually we could submit it to some, a real, you know, go to Abrams or someone. And then we could include the, COVID experience, that would be interesting because that was a whole other animal to deal with. Bert is so good at negotiating and calmly straightening out problems and all that because we have the state and the park saying, yeah, but we don't want to be attracting people to the park because we don't want them to gather. So we made all kinds of accommodations because of COVID. That would be a kind of an interesting thing too. So I don't know. There's like more work to be done, maybe. There but you thank go. you for that. Fertile ground for a continuing project. Actually, right. this uh, leads me to one of my next uh, questions, which is we have a viewer who is in Michigan and is wondering how they can uh, order a book. So it, is it possible to order books through Jabberwocky? You can order books through Jabberwocky and that helps Jabberwocky, of course. Um, but you can also order it through Amazon. If you, you know, just look for the, yeah, you can get it through Amazon. And if you, anyway, that's the answer <laughs> right now, maybe in the future, it'll be more widely uh, available. Excellent. All right. I have a question for Bert. Uh, have you ever had difficulty with people damaging or climbing on displays? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So we have, um, Many of us have done um, a lot of work that is public and probably me as much as any. Um, you know, I've done a lot of public work uh, that have been part of things like First Night and I've been working with things that are meant to have control. So I'm sort of inviting problems. Um, so, so we have a lot of knowledge around, you know, rope that is strong and, uh, you know, sailing lines that our thousand pound test and so forth. And so we try to then advise artists um, and to help and make sure that things are, are strong enough and, uh, and won't, won't break, um, but sometimes they do. But we've, we actually you know our, our, uh, our, record, our record is pretty good. And you know, my, my own philosophy, my things involve handles is that you know, a person should be able to hang on the handle and literally try to climb up it and it should not break, you know, <laughs> that's, that's the standards to which I hold myself. And, and, and one Damon and Gordon's piece with the ladders that the choice showed, you know, that looked iffy, but it, it too was built with super strong line. And, you know, and I kind of went through and we checked everything and climbed on it and made sure it was okay. But so. But also people draw on things and, you know, yeah. there are, there are impacts from both weather and people. Yeah. And there, you know, it, it's something that we, that artists have to be ready for, right? It's, you're putting something out in unsupervised in a park overnight, every night for three weeks. And yes, there's, there's been some, some pieces that have been vandalized, but actually Surprisingly little of that too, you know, I think there was some of that in the in the, more of it in the first year, but I think that now we are a known part of the community, right? I think there's a, there's a sense of respect for what's there now that, um, you know, we always cross our fingers, but really we've had very, very good luck that way. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Another Question, uh, what is inside the peepholes installation? I don't know who wants to answer that. 
that's not the only installation that they put peepholes in either, because there were some of Gordon, I mean, um, Chuck's gourd things have peepholes too, but they set up these weird little, like, you look through the hole and there's like a little scene that is kind of surprising, unusual or whatever. Yep. And I find it kind of ironic that they use to, for the enclosure, they use doors. Doors are all fastened together so they're not openable. And you have to just peek inside. It was perfect. <laughs> right. They were little, they were little sort of vignette stories. Yeah. Hopefully, I wonder if it was was it was it possible to photograph that? Well, it might just be ephemeral. That's okay too, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and the flip side of that is at least one of Chuck's, you could put it on over your head and see out of it a certain way, you know? Hmm. It's amazing the range of things artists will think of, you know? <laughs> well, that actually leads me to my next question, which I'm going to direct to Nancy. Uh, can you share some stories about how you get your inspirations for an outdoor piece? Uh, I don't know. It, yeah, it, it has to do with the, the site. I, well, I can think of one that was, um, there's this beautiful um, feature near where the old house site used to be. It's a curved stone wall with a curve behind it of cedar trees and you could see the river through that. And usually I don't use the same site twice. I always get drawn to some place that hasn't been used. Um, that's what I look for. But this site, I've put something there twice. One was a band of fabric of different colors and then a couple years ago, it was, or last year, I guess it was, it was um, a, a band of fish, which I'm happy to say moved on and was donated to the Ipswich um, River um, organization to be used to advertise the fish migration in the Ipswich River. So anyway. Well, it that has actually, a lot to do with the place. Yeah. That's, that's, that partially answers the one, another question here, uh, which is that have any of the sculptures become permanent installations elsewhere, which sounds like happened for you. Um, it's, I used. Saw it's used. I think there have been. Bert, do you know? Yeah, so I think, I think um, the word permanent um, is probably the tough <laughs> one. Um, Joyce. <laughs> Joyce, is, who has made things of metal, some of her things could be yes. considered permanent, but, but part of it, you know, if you're making something that's going to be out for three weeks, um, you know, you can use wood, as I do, and wood can last a long time, but it's never permanent. And, um, and that's part of the freedom that comes with it, too. I mean, there's something different about saying, I'm building something for this site that's going to be there for three weeks. I think that, that gives artists a freedom that you might not have if you're thinking I'm building something where I'm spending a lot of money on materials and it's going to be permanent. I think, you know, that, that's that's part of why the work is all, there's so much great work that gets done. My, the green pod, the structure of that was uh, in my garden the next year to put run beans up. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> as a footnote to that, um, I did a steel piece for the show called The Whistler, and I sold it later to a person who lives in Newburyport. So once in a while, they become more permanent. <laughs> but most are not. What was that? Especially if you work in steel, sounds like. Yeah, and steel is a little bit more durable. <laughs> Bert's first piece went to the firehouse, right? That's right. right. Yeah, where it still yeah. is. Yeah, and it still is in the firehouse. Yeah, in the stairwell. Uh, yeah. Sadly, sadly, no longer swinging. But uh, oh, I love that! Like, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that so that piece in its in it, when it was actually installed had handles and you could pull the handles and it swung exactly as you actually swing if you're swinging on a on a swing set. Anyway. Fun. All right, we have time for one more question, and it's somewhat loaded one. So I'll uh, I'll throw it out to you, and then we'll we'll say our goodbyes. Uh, but it, it's have you any of your exhibits, any of the exhibits involved, 
political statements that produced a strong reaction from the public or the media. We're not supposed to because yeah. it's a public park. And the park um, looks at all the applications to make sure that things are appropriate for the general public and safe. And so, although some pieces sort of have little hints of political messages in a subtle way, it's not supposed to, we're not supposed to do a political. So it's actually, it's actually pretty interesting. You, the state of Massachusetts has a rule in which you are not allowed to do anything that could be considered political advertising within a state park. Mm -hmm. And so it's, so that, you know, for the park who, who we must say are wonderfully supportive and have put up with us and supported us for 20 years, you know, that for them, that's a solid, that's a line, right? That's, that's a line and, and they get to decide what's on one side of it and what's on another. Um, but, but, I think what that often leads to is is better art because if you say I want to do an art that has a political element to it, but I can't just say it. I can't just put up the billboard. I have to do it in a way in which it's it's a sculpture and it's 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 there but it's subtle. That often leads to um, to stronger work. Actually, in the in the twenty in last year's show. There is a beautiful piece by a first time artist. Um, oh, Joyce, come up with this. I'm sorry, I, I will. I don't know which piece you're thinking about. <laughs> Describe it. Um, the, the, all the, the bells, the hanging bells in the cages. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. And, and his initial um, conception was going to have text that went on each cage that sort of oh. had very specific. Um, oh, it was so much better that it didn't. Right, right. And so, you know, as we talk about it, he, you know, he sort of realized that his statement was there and he didn't need to sort of hit you over the head. You know, he didn't need to yeah. write it. More powerful. Yeah. But it, but it was, but it was, it was still there. And why so don't you, why don't you uh, verbally describe what the elements were? Just so that she is more clear on it. So it was a series of square cages going down a hill, um, kind of catty corner to each other, and each each cage had a beautiful uh, hand ceramic ceramic bell, ceramic bell that, that he had created. They look very Asian. And I'm going to you guys keep talking, I'm gonna come up with his his name. <laughs> So, you know, you can see that sometimes you can't quite fully escape it, but there are no, usually no overt uh, messages like that. And I think it's a good thing because that would alienate half of your audience right there, you know, because no matter what side you pick, you're alienating the other. So, oh, let me just Larry, answer the question. Larry, Larry Lardo. What is his name again? Larry? Alardo. 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 Yes, Larry Alardo. Very good. Thank you. Okay, there yes. we go. You're off. You're off those work. And just in time, because we're we're gonna wrap. Uh, we're gonna wrap up. Uh, I know that we have a lot of questions here that we did not have a chance to to ask you. Um, do you have a way that folks can get in touch with you if they want more information about the show or about the book? Um, well, my website is my full name dot com, dot com. You could. Contact me there. Maybe Bert has a. Let's put it in the in the uh, in the chat. Yes, and so then for the show itself, Monsley Sculpture One Word dot org. Okay. All right, Monsley Sculpture dot org and uh, and. Joyce Audi Tharens is it dot com? Yes. Sorry? Okay. Yep. And Nancy, do you have a, a contact that you'd like to offer? Um. Uh, just we don't, I'm, we don't in, have to. I'm in the phone book. <laughs> well, that says a lot. And yeah. Bert or I could direct all questions to Nancy if she wants. There you yeah. go. But, it's and the, yeah, either one of them. Yeah. The Modsley website is probably a good place to start. I think, yeah. But I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for 
uh, appearing here as part of the Newburyport Literary Festival. Um, it has been such an incredible weekend, and this is the this is the the cherry on top for me. This is my my last hosted event, so <laughs> now you're off the hook. Huh? Out with a bang. That's right. My, my husband has sneaked a margarita into the. Into the <laughs> well, that house. sounds like a good idea. <laughs> He's a good husband. So thank you all. And thank you to all of uh, our attendees uh, who are. I mean, you are. Watching this oh, woo that's my daughter. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I love it. California. Oh my God. Well, thank you all for, for coming in and spending your valuable time with us here at the Newburyport Literary Festival. And we wish you the greatest of success with your book. Thank you so much for all the work that you do oh. in our community. And I think uh, the book will inspire a lot of participation and conversation around the, the outdoor sculpture. So thank you again. And thank I you. wish you a wonderful end of the day on Sunday. Thank you. And thanks. Uh, Thank you, Bethany. Thank you. You've been very patient with us. It's been great fun. Thank you all. All right, thanks. Okay. Bye -bye.